Well, good morning to you. My brothers from other mothers. And sisters from different misters. Today, welcome to a messy church. And if your life is messy, you're in really good company. <laughs> For the last few weeks, we have established firmly that Jesus didn't intend life to be clean and neat and tidy. That, see, it's a messy place. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. As you get out your notes, the big idea for the series is this is that the world is a messy place, but God uses our messes to help us become like Jesus. Today we're going to talk about difficulty. Okay, anybody feel me? Okay, difficult people, difficult circumstances, difficult situations. We're going to talk about difficulty here. And Jesus uh, promised us that it was going to be difficult. He promised us also that he would present and that he would walk with us. Now, my wife and I, we used to, we lived in Orange County, California. And I was at this one ministry position, and it became clear that it was time for us to move on to go to another one. And so I was interviewing around the country, and I had three different job offers. I had one in Boca Raton, Florida, one in Houston, and one in Los Angeles. And as we prayed about it, and we thought about it, and we're just like, oh, man, I don't know what to do and everything, we really felt like God was, was affirming in us that we needed to go to the church in L.A. Now, the issue with that was, on paper, it was by far the worst of the choices, Right? It was like less money, it would be less, I don't know, status or influence. It, was, it would be kind of more like more or less kind of a lateral move, you know. But apparently God was not concerned with my upward mobility. And so he said, and, and as we prayed about this, we were firmly convinced of this. He said, Troy, I want you to go here, and it's going to be hard. And we did, and it was. And we spent four years there in a, in a pretty difficult, pretty challenging ministry situation. Now, I'm going to step away from that story, and we're going to come back to it later, all right? I'm going to leave you on pins and needles for a little bit so you can see how it goes. And some of you, you I, want, I want to challenge you to listen to this message a little bit differently because I'm going to step away from that story to immerse you in another one. And you're used to kind of getting the big idea for the day up front, but I want to tell you that we're going to get the big idea later on, okay? So can you hang with me, and you're going to get that later on. For those of you who like to open up your Christmas presents on Christmas Eve, I promise the morning is coming. <laughs> but we're going to head into this adventure that this guy Paul has been on. We love Paul. We've been talking about him in the book of Acts for a while now. We're going to be talking about this epic adventure that Paul has in Acts chapter 27. Now, as Dan pointed out to us last week, we have Paul who's been in prison for five years, and he has been writing letters to all these new churches that he started all over Asia there. And he, in a lot of ways, he kind of is the gospel to them. And he says this to these people. He said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Another translation says, follow me as I follow Christ. And then God gives Paul a vision in a dream to say, Paul, you are going to go to Rome. Now, Paul didn't know how he's going to get to Rome, but he knows he's going to be going to Rome. So we're talking about difficulty here. And I want to tell you something. Paul knew something about difficulty. Paul, Paul was intimate with difficulty. He had suffered all kinds of persecution for sharing this message of the gospel, this idea that you can know that you're okay with God. That God has come himself and done something for us that we could never do for ourselves. And in sharing this message, it was very threatening to a lot of different people. And he experienced a lot of difficulty. It says something like this in 2 Corinthians 11. He says, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. The Jews considered 40 lashes to be a death sentence. So 40 lashes minus one was just short of a death sentence. He was lashed five times with 39 lashes. Can you imagine the gasps when he took his shirt off to bathe, when people saw his mangled and scarred body? But he goes on. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. You see, when they stoned someone, they didn't stop until they thought you were dead. And somehow Paul survives this. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles. It's like nobody seems to like this poor guy. In danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. Yet Paul says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. 
And we find Paul in prison. And he's gone through several trials now, and he's starting to get fed up. So he's standing before the big dude. His name is Festus. And he says to Festus, I am a Roman citizen. I'm appealing to Caesar. Now, Festus, who really wanted to let him go, it says, all right, I would have let you go. But since you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar, you will go. Paul is going to go to Rome. But he's going under Roman escort. He's got these guards that are going to take him on this trip to Rome, just as God has promised. Now, so how's Paul going to get there? Well, he's not going to walk, right? He's not going to get in a plane. Paul got on a boat. He got on a really big boat. Okay, this boat, now, the, the scripture says there are 276 passengers on this boat. And there's this enormous uh, haul of grain that would be down in the hold of the boat, probably being imported from Egypt to Rome. Now, 276 people is a lot of people. That's like a Boeing 737. And what would happen is the boat was called a coaster. It wouldn't go out to open sea, but it would pop from port to port to port. And as it went along, it would take on passengers and let other passengers off. And as they came on, they would basically come on and they would camp out on the deck of the ship. So it was kind of like, a, like an oil tanker meets a city bus meets a KOA campground. And there's this enormous variety of people on this boat. They would be coming from all these different cities with different cultures. They would be having different dialects and different accents, you know. They would be on the, on the, camping out on the ship, and they would be cooking their food, and you would smell all these different foods. I'm pretty sure there was curry in the air. And they would, they would tell their stories, and they would laugh, and they would play their music. And here is Paul, who is a prisoner, Right? Paul and his two buddies, Luke and Aristarchus, very likely they were the only Christians on the boat because this is a very new fledgling little religious movement. And these guys are in the corner of the ship where all the prisoners hang out. Right? Paul has no influence. He has no voice. And he's surrounded by these people from all these different cultures and all these different walks of life who share different values. They would worship all these different gods like Isis and Artemis and Poseidon and, and, and Zeus. And they would have all these little altars set up. They probably had different moral values. They probably had different sexual practices. And it's probably fair to say that the wind of the culture was blowing in a different direction than that of Paul and his buddies. You feel me? Right? So here's the kind of the milieu, the idiom that Paul finds himself in on this boat. And he's not just the low man on the totem pole. Man, he is the no man on the totem pole. He's a prisoner, probably already convicted of guilt in everybody's minds here as he's surrounded by these Roman centurions. Okay? It's a highly stratified, highly hierarchical society. And he has no value. He has no voice with these people. Now, we have this adventure here in Acts chapter 27. It's a sea saga, okay? So it's going to be this amazing adventure on this boat. And it starts off like this. Since much time had passed, and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over. Okay, the fast. That's called the Day of Atonement. It's a Jewish holiday, Yom Kippur. And it would typically mark the beginning of the rainy season. So you didn't want to go out, and you didn't want to sail because it became more unpredictable. No one sails after Yom Kippur, Paul would say. Okay, it's a bad idea. But I'm going to show you this map. Check this out. So... They have been bouncing from port to port all across the Aegean Sea, and now they have wound up on this island called Crete, right? Now, they're trying to decide if they're going to take a quick little, like a day trip from about here to about here, because this is a bad place to winter, but the winds are not in their favor, things aren't working, they're having this argument about whether they should continue to go on here. So, we go back here to Paul. Paul advised him saying this, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul had to say. He said, hey, Paul, you know what? I appreciate it, prisoner guy. All right? We appreciate your input, but we're going to trust the professionals over here. Okay? This is what these guys do for a living, so thanks for your input. And they decided to go ahead and go. Now, had they noticed Paul was wearing this t-shirt that day that says, been shipwrecked three times and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. <laughs> it might have been helpful. But they passed over that little tidbit of information. So, they weighed anchor and they took off along the shore. Now, they had expectations about how the day was going to go. Right? They, they, everybody, just like you and I, they had expectations. They probably thought some of the passengers on the ship, they're going, hey, you know, we're going to have a nice little sail today, and then we'll go to port, we'll have lunch, and maybe we'll go by Home Depot, and we'll go look at some flooring, you know, stuff like that, and, and maybe we'll go to Bed Bath & Beyond. I don't know. I don't know if we'll have time. 
And you have expectations when you get up on Monday morning as to how the day is going to go. <laughs> you're headed to work. Maybe you're headed to school. Maybe you got the week pretty planned out. You're a really good planner, and you've got your day timer, and everything is set. And these people were no different. They had very specific expectations on how it was going to go. Now I'm going to give you a little heads up here. Okay, so here's where they thought they were going to go. They were going from here to here, just a little jaunt, okay? But a storm comes up, and instead they go over here. It's a 587-mile detour over the open ocean. So they really thought they were going to be out just on a three-hour tour. A three-hour tour. They had expectations about how things were going to go, but see... They got on the sea, and it looked placid. It looked like the winds were in their favor. Everything looked like it was nice. They're full of expectation. But things start to slowly shift. Maybe they should have heeded Paul's warning. And remember, this is a sailboat in the purest sense. There's no outboard motor. There's no, Biff, fire up the outboard. The winds are not in our favor. Set a cocktail up to the crow's nest. I'm parched. No. They are absolutely at the mercy of the wind and the waves, and it becomes more violent and more violent. The scripture says it like this, but soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land, and when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it, and we were driven along. They used supports to undergird the ship because it was so violent that the, shot, the ship was going to be torn apart by the power of the storm. And since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. They gave up hope of even making a profit at all on the ship, so they tossed the grain overboard, trying to lighten the ship. And then on the third day, they jettisoned the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. They're just trying to live. They think, we've got to do something to lighten this boat. We're all going to die out here. Verse 20, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us. All hope of being saved was at last abandoned. They have given up hope. They think they are dead after several days of being pounded and beaten by the wind and the waves. The people have lost hope in the storm. Day and night and day and night, there's no Coast Guard. No one's looking for them. There's no radio. There's no GPS. They navigate by the stars. They can't see the stars. They literally don't know where they are. And they are terrified. And they are exhausted. And they are in suspense. And there's no Dramamine. In the ancient world, you see, the ocean represented chaos and death and darkness. And this relentless storm is pushing them deeper and deeper into the heart of of darkness, day after day, night after night, relentlessly it pushes on. Day nine, day 10, they are sick and terrified and hungry and exhausted. Day 11, day 12, day 13, it doesn't let up. Verse 21, since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, man, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet, now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God whom I belong and whom I worship, and he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted to you all those who sail with you. In verse 25, so take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. You see, Paul speaks hope to a people who have lost all hope. And still, it pounds them. The storm relentlessly pushes them deeper and deeper and further out into the open water. And when the 14th night had come, as we were being driven along the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. And as the sailors were seeking escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, they were going to sneak off. 
Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. In other words, we're going to need these professional sailors if we have any hope of landing the ship anywhere from the book of First Duh, chapter 1. <laughs> and then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go and said, boys, you're going to stay with us, okay? As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Now get this. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength. Circle that word strength in your notes. For not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Are you kidding me? Right? So Paul clearly shares the source of his hope. Now, when you go back to that verse, that word that you circled, strength, right? Almost everywhere in the New Testament, the Greek word for strength there is soteria. Say that, soteria. soteria. It's almost always translated salvation. And Paul is sitting here saying, I want you to take some food for your salvation. Now get this. Okay, their lives are in danger. They don't think they're going to survive this trip. Paul stands up in front of these people and said, take some food for your salvation. Then he prays to his God and blesses this bread and breaks it. If you're a Christ follower, you should have like buzzers and alarms going off in your head right now. What does it look like he's doing? It sounds a lot like communion, right? He's in front of all of these people who worship all these different gods of all these different worldviews and different values. He says, your lives are in danger. You think you're about to die. So take some of this bread. Jesus is the bread of for your salvation. Are you kidding me? How gutsy is this guy? And he prays to his God in front of all of them. And it says, and they took some food and they were encouraged. Verse 39. Now when it was day, they didn't recognize the land. The storm is still pushing them along, right? But they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned if possible to run the ship ashore. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable and the stern was being broken up by the surf. It was still so powerful. It was tearing the ship apart. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners lest any should swim away and escape. Why? Because if you're a soldier in charge of a prisoner and that prisoner gets away, you suffer that prisoner's punishment. And very often, it was death. So they said, we're not taking any chances. We're going to just go ahead and kill them all. No one's going to miss them anyway. And that way, we'll, we'll play it safe here. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept from them carrying out their plan. Paul goes from... Prisoner guy, no man, no voice, no influence to being an encouragement to eventually he comes to the point where he's practically leading this ship, 276 people through a storm for two weeks. Why did the centurion want to save his life? I want to pose this. Paul has respect because he shows respect. Paul has respect because he shows respect we're going to step away from the beach here for a minute. I want to go to Jerusalem where Paul's buddy Peter is one of the leaders in Jerusalem. And Peter writes this letter to all the churches spread out all over Asia. He says to, to basically to Christ followers who are in these fledgling little Christian communities. And he's saying this. Remember, you guys are in the minority. Remember, you guys are not like everybody else, right? The wind of value and culture and, and sexual mores and politics and all these things are different from the ones that you hold. And so Peter is writing a letter to all these people to tell them, and in that context, this is how you are to behave. You feel me? Peter writes this, 1 Peter chapter 2, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. All malice? Ah, all, uh, I got this great Facebook post about the Supreme Court I'm about to put up. It's going to get a lot of likes. Are you sure, Paul? Yeah. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Hold on, hold on. The emperor. That's that guy who believes in different things than I believe, and I didn't vote for him. Yeah, honor the emperor. Verse 315, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. 
always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. Circle that word hope. But do this with gentleness and respect. He's saying, hey, Peter's telling all these Christ followers spread out all over Asia, you guys are in the minority. You guys are not all that influential, but you are different. And when people ask why you are different, ask why you have this hope, why do you behave the way you do under such trial and such persecution and such stress, tell them why. But do this with gentleness and respect. Why? So they can receive what you have to offer. You see, don't expect people who aren't Christ followers to act like they are. Paul certainly didn't expect that when he was on that boat. Peter's telling them the same thing. See, if if you're all floating around out in the open ocean, and we're looking for a piece of wreckage to float on, somehow to survive it, somehow to make it to shore, if you're going to push a piece of, of, of a plank to somebody to save their life, you don't set it on fire first, right? You don't say, hey, you know, if you hadn't been sleeping around, you wouldn't be in this mess. Jesus loves you. Well, you know, you kind of get what you get when you vote for that political party. Jesus loves you. No. He doesn't have an expectation that they're going to act any different than they are. See, Paul was the kind of person they could receive from. Someone who walked in humility. Someone who had a listening ear. Someone who showed respect. And at the same time, he was clear about the source of his hope. We're back on the beach now. Paul has given out orders, right? They're about ready to get on the shore. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And why is he so confident of this? Why does, he, why, why does he just have so much confidence that he can stand in front of these people from all these backgrounds, going from nobody to ordering them around? Why does he have this hope? Because, see, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And Jesus enters into the storm. Jesus enters into the darkness. Jesus faces death, and he comes out on the other side with life. Follow me as I follow Christ. And in him, we're going to make it through this storm. In him, there's going to be life. In him, there is hope. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians. For our light and momentary troubles, (laughs) our light and momentary troubles, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all, that all the hurt, all the difficulty, all the challenge when we walk in the promise of that relationship with God, it's going to seem so small. Teresa of Avila says, all of the hurt and all the pain of humanity is going to feel like one night in an inconvenient hotel. So Paul goes on, he says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Here's the big idea for the day. Everyone is on a ship that is going down. But it's my privilege to bring hope to the passengers. These guys were in, this is a real story, okay? This isn't a parable or an allegory of some kind. They were on a real ship, on a real ocean, in a real storm with really terrified people. They needed real salvation. And it has real application for you and I today. See, the storm that you were in, now get this, the storm that you were in, the difficulty that you were in, this circumstance may have nothing to do with you and everything to do with somebody else. The season of life that you're in, there's no accident that you're in this storm. There's no accident that you're on this particular boat. And there's no accident that these particular people are around you right now in this storm. Paul Paul went on a 587-mile detour. Do we really think it was about his character formation? Right? He'd been shipwrecked three times already. He's already gone through a lot. How much more refining does the guy need? But maybe, maybe it wasn't about him. Maybe it wasn't about his character. Maybe it wasn't about his discipleship. Maybe it was about his buddy Luke, who's playing cards with some centurion and just being a kind, nice guy, an encouraging guy. And that centurion is going to go back home to Rome someday, and he's going to talk to his family about this Dr. Luke, who is this really articulate, intelligent, gracious, kind man who worshiped this guy named Jesus. 
And he tells his wife and he tells his son. And then later on, you know, Christianity comes to Rome and his son remembers about this guy that his father told him about and he goes to investigate it. Maybe it wasn't about Paul at all. Maybe it had to do with those other 273 people on the boat. Maybe, maybe when they land on the island of Malta and they winter there for three months, something else was going on. And now there's a 2,000-year-old heritage of Christianity on the island of Malta. I want to posit to you that maybe it had nothing to do with Paul and everything to do with everyone else. So back to my story. We go to this church in L.A., and it was hard. And I, we all tend to view like our difficulties like somehow it's about our character formation. You know, well... Surely I need some humbling, so this is a good humility lesson for me for four years at this place. Maybe God's kind of, you know, grinding off the rough edges in my character, and I'm sure he was. <laughs> but maybe the more important reason I was there was when I stopped this man, and I grabbed him by the shoulders, and I shook him when he was on the way to a divorce lawyer. And he's still married today. Maybe it was this couple of young people that I kept kind of challenging and poking and prodding for them to kind of become worship leaders, and they did, and they went to other churches, and they're serving in that capacity. Maybe it was more about them. Maybe it was more, it had nothing to do with me, and it was these people that my wife were involved with, these intercessors, these prayer people that she was learning and being trained in how to, how to do this intercessory prayer thing. Maybe it had everything to do with what was going on in her. Maybe it's, because we met this infertility doctor while we were there and now there are two little boys making messes in my house. Maybe that was why. But I want to tell you this. In the midst of the hurt, in the midst of the difficulty, and the midst of the fact that it may very well be about the people who are around you, God is just big enough to work it out for all of us at the same time. He is sovereign enough and powerful enough and wise enough to work out his purposes in them and in you. Because in Jesus, there is life on the other side of the storm. And there's life for all of us. So here's what you're thinking, some of you. How can I help other people when I can't get my own act together? And I want to tell you, you're exactly who God is looking for. Jesus loves to use people who know they don't have their act together. And he has a hard time using people who think they have their act together. If anybody had a reason to opt out, it was Paul, right? I mean, this guy, he for fun used to chase down and hunt down Christians and have them beaten and imprisoned. He approved of it when they were murdered. Could he have not stood before God and said, you've got to get somebody else. No one is going to listen to me. And yet it's that same guy, Paul, who wrote, now there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, even me. You don't think you're strong enough? I want to tell you that you are strong enough. That Christ in you, the hope of glory, is strong enough. That's why Paul said, I will glory all the more in my weakness because when I am weak, then I am made strong. And the same man wrote, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. You are strong enough. You're exactly the kind of person he wants to use. And we don't want to minimize your hurt. I don't want to minimize the pain that you're experiencing, the difficulty uh, that you're in, that weird job that you're in with the, that didn't turn out the way it was supposed to. And, but maybe, maybe you're there for a different reason. The sickness, the illness, the season that you're going through, and you wonder, well, God, why? Why is this all, all this going on? But maybe it's just the proximity God is putting you in with other people. Maybe it's all of the above but he wants to use you. You've got a couple of fill-ins at the end there. And I just want you to ask yourself this question. You don't have to write this in right now because you might be sitting next to the person. But who is on the same ship? Who is in the wreckage? Who is in the challenge with you? Who is in the storm with you right now? And how can you bring hope to that person? How can you be a blessing? Once I was uh, sitting in a car, a, a van, with some relatives, and, and some of our relatives are Christians and some of them aren't. And the ones who were uh, Christ followers were complaining about how belligerent and overbearing one of, one of the non-Christians were. And I, I'll never forget this. I'm sitting there, and they, she goes, you know what? God didn't call me to be a doormat. 
God did not call me to be a doormat. I'm not going to be his doormat. And I just wanted to go, oh, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> See, was, was Jesus a doormat? When he was lied about and slandered, did he retaliate in kind? Or was Paul a doormat? I want, I want to tell you this. I don't think we're called to be doormats, but I do think you were called to be a welcome mat. And the welcome mat knows it's not about itself, right? <laughs> the welcome mat sometimes gets dirty, and it gets looked down upon, and it gets scuffed. But you know what the welcome mat does? It says, come on in. Come out of the storm. Come out of the rain. Come and warm yourself by the fire. Come and get cleaned up. Come and sit at the table with the rest of us sinners. <laughs> and we'll eat and we'll drink and we'll cry a little and we'll laugh a lot. And we'll put funny sweaters on tiny dogs. <laughs> and we'll yell at the TV when our team is losing. And lean your head against Jesus' shoulder and find life on the other side of the storm. We're going to have some prayer partners down here. If you would love to pray with somebody, to talk to somebody today, they would love to be that person for you. If God is raising something up in your heart right now, they are available to you. But I want to leave you with this. <laughs> My beautiful welcome mats in this messy, messy life. You great purveyors of hope in the storm. May you be energized by resurrection hope. That as you follow Jesus, you can ask other people to follow along because we know there is life on the other side. May you be a blessing where you are because you understand that the spirit of the living God is alive in you to work in and through and beyond you in ways you can't possibly imagine. And may you understand that when you are weak, he is made strong in you. So you are strong enough. Today go and understand that where you are, you are a blessing because of Christ in you. Grace and peace to you, my brothers and sisters. We'll see you next week.